On the green, right? Okay. Yeah. And the way I hope to get these deformations in, like, uh, in general was uh, like a framework that was uh, proposed by Parker, Weiser, and Lombard in 2008-2009 with this called uh, the so-called deformation equation. I will talk a little bit more uh, about it soon, but it's, it's a perturbative method and it's based on the charges, so it has nothing to do with our matrix so far. It's like it's uh, it's based on the charges. It's very nice. It uh, it, uh, it uses the, the boost operator sometimes. Um, and in some sense, it helps us to uh, discover if a Hamiltonian, a long range Hamiltonian, is integral or not. Or if we start with some nearest neighbor and you try to deform from it, uh, you can you can find integrable deformations. But the question that. Um, that we have, like, in, uh, it's, it's, uh, it was not known, is like uh, how to get the lux and the R matrix for these. Uh, so, this formalism gives us the, the charges. We know how to, to get the, the deformations of the Hamiltonian, but it will be very interesting to know the lux and the R matrix. So, we can, for example, use the algebraic batanzas and, uh, and do more like advanced integrated techniques. So, this is the main point of the talk to, to find how to construct these R matrix and these lux for a specific Hamiltonian. Um, and these long range spin chains they appear in many places, like as I said in equals 4. There's, for example, this, uh, this paper by Didina Servan and Matthias Stalbacher. And they investigated the relation between the dilatation operator in planar and equals 4 and the Inozemte spin chain. And this is quite interesting, and also, like, it's a very interesting point because also this, um, this specific model doesn't have an R matrix. So the zoo of like long range spin chains and that interval can be quite different. Like this model specifically is very interesting and doesn't have an R matrix. Um, and but still like a coordinate pattern that was applied to it. So it's, it's a very wide subject. It's very, um, in my opinion, it's very interesting. And But we will focus uh, on the ones that uh, you can write an R matrix actually. Uh, and the plan for the talk is like first to explain how this deformation equation works, so like this, uh, this, this, uh, this way to to deform, uh, to find long-range deformations of uh, of the, the Hamiltonian, and then 
the very basic part of the method we will apply, it already works in nearest neighbor. So um, just to explain the basics, I will use a nearest, nearest neighbor case, just a six vertex model, just to, to show the basics. And, and then I'll explain how to generalize uh, for long range spin chains. Um, perturbatively, like uh, every time we say something is integrable here, it will be perturbatively integrable. So at each order, we have to check all the all the things. And then I will show some conclusions and open questions. So the deformation equation, like you, is, in principle, if you have like a long range uh, charge, um, you can write like this. Are the usual charges. So if you have the Hamiltonian, if you, you were studying the Hamiltonian, you would be studying Q2. But then as you go higher, you have like a larger. So usually, like a Q, like if you are studying a Hamiltonian that's nearest neighbor, then your Q3 has like um, has to nearest neighbor, like the range increases. The same way here, but we have to like um, in this case, each of these QRN has range R plus N. So this is just like uh, the basic expansion. But in order to have integrability, one needs to check that this commutation happens at uh, like, in this we should happen for all, all the charges at all orders, but then you have to check for uh, perturbatively. Uh, and the deformation equation that they wrote is basically, basically you know, is, is this equation. And it means that all the long range uh, like uh, deformations will be solutions of this equation. And this X can be many things. It can be like local operators, boosted charges, by local charges. And using this, uh, this expansion, uh, one can find that uh, the, the solution perturbatively is this one. And it was checked by them. And then in this next paper, like this uh, paper like four or five years later, that if you just, uh, that all the solutions that you found by basic uh, like expanding here, and, and if you put there, they actually, like there is a one-to-one -one, like uh, uh, correspondence. So this equation is kind of a conjecture, but it was checked very extensively that it works. Uh, and in this paper in particular, uh, among other things, they classified all the range three deformations of the six vertex model. Um, and like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll arrange this. Um, and our question, for example, since the, this deformation equation is not proved, uh, is that if all these deformations correspond or not to a lax operator, it could be that they don't. Uh, so this is one of the questions also we, we would like to answer. Yeah, so, oops. So let's start by discussing the method for um, uh, nearest neighbor. So it's well known that for a periodic chain, we can construct the transfer matrix, which is the generating function of all our, our charges, by uh, taking the case over a product like a, a product of lax operators. And if uh, uh, the lax is regular, so if uh, when we put the spectral parameter to zero, it becomes permutation. And, uh, we can compute the charges by taking log derivatives. Uh, on the transfer matrix and putting the spectral parameter to zero. And we know that this lax satisfy this RLL equation, where this R is the R matrix, which is the solution of the young baxter equation. So this is just some, some basic information that uh, uh, in quantum spin chains we usually use. Uh, and the plan here is like, we start with some unsets Hamiltonian. And here I just put um, a particular case of the six vertex model. And these images here in the onsets, they are constant. They will not depend on the spectral parameter. Um, and we use that the boundary on the boundary conditions that L prime will, uh, at u equals to zero will be uh, p times the Hamiltonian, the density Hamiltonian, and that the, the lax is regular. So if we do that, and then we write an expansion for the lax, on this way, so the first two terms are the, determined by the boundary conditions, and then we have the rest of the expansion. Um, and again, like uh, now, like all the u dependence, all the dependence on the spectral parameter is on uh, on that uh, l there, like explicitly. So all these um, um, l i's will be constants. Uh, 
on with respect to the spectral parameter. So okay, just following the, the normal method, we can apply the we can find Q2 by applying the first derivative on the on the log of transformation of transfer matrix. And then we can find Q3 by applying twice the derivative. And then the first thing we require is that uh, uh, um, Q2 with Q3 is zero. Um, and at this point, uh, in all the method, uh, like we will forget that Q2 is squared that appears on this uh, because um, Q2 automatically commutes with Q2, right? So for the method, it doesn't contribute with anything. So we will, we will forget that Q2. Uh, and just by solving this equation, we realize that for this method, um, this model specifically, um, it only fixes for us one of the those uh, one of those uh, matrix elements. All the rest uh, are free at this order. And then we compute the next order. So we compute Q4. And again, we have this first pair, which now has three derivatives here. But uh, the rest, it has to do with Q3. But we just solve it to have Q2 with Q3 equals to zero, and Q2 still commutes with Q2. So we can ignore this again, and only solve uh, like basically this part. And this? I, I'm not quite sure I understand. How, how do you control the range of these interactions? How did it start? Um, I missed something in the beginning. So for this case, um, uh, uh, we are doing uh, a still nearest neighbor, so I didn't say anything uh, yet about the range of the... Mm -hmm. Ah, so all so these higher charges also, they just the, act on... The, the, in principle, they should. Uh, the, in principle, like Q3 should have range 3, Q4 should have range 4. Yes. But uh, because... But, but, but this extra, uh, this higher range is here. When you, oops, when you do Q2 times Q2, the range increases. Uh, so this first term is always like nearest neighbor, uh, and this is a big advantage of the method because you never need to worry uh, about uh, these extra terms because uh, because this just they just, since you you end up always checking one order before uh, the previous ones always already commute and you can yeah you can always like when you take more derivatives you can always rewrite the, all the terms that are not this first one in terms of the previous charges you had so. So all these, um, this behavior that the charges go uh, like uh, higher and higher range, you don't need to worry uh, because of the, the, the way this works. Is it obvious? Uh, for me, it's not obvious because you first have to, to take the derivative, then put two equals to zero. Um, so you get from, so you uh, q two. Q2 square is something like uh, T inverse of lambda, T prime of lambda. And mm -hmm. you got also something from the second derivative there. I mean, if you take further derivative, it oh, no, but it, it, more terms. Write, oh, but uh, yeah, we checked it. Uh, we did quite a few orders, and we could always rewrite. Uh, like We did like uh, like really many, and we always get. Uh, I believe that, but I ask, is it obvious? For me, it's not obvious. I see. Yeah, no, no. Like, yeah, when, when, you, when you do like this one, your right is just uh, t minus 1 uh, t prime of 0, mm -hmm. but then you get it twice. Yeah. So we're calling this q, q2 squared. But when, when you do for the next one, uh, right. You have uh, quite a few terms, yeah. but you, you, you were writing. It's, I agree, it's not obvious. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but you, you yeah, it, it worked. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So your form of the Lux matrix was an ansatz? I mean, um, if you go back. It was, um, so why those zeros are outside? You, you specified this form. So what's the reason to specify that form for the Oh, uh, Because like the first two terms, are just the boundary conditions. Yeah, sure. And, uh, it's an, yeah, it's an, that's your answer. It's not the most general one. Oh, you mean because I could start with a negative... Uh, oh, I could, you could put uh, something, something else. else. Yeah. If you deform the six vertex model R matrix, you could also change the matrix structure, have something... Mm -hmm. in yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree, I agree. Yeah, so... Can you, can so you, can you back, go back one slide uh, to look at the Hamiltonian? So, yes. yeah, the Hamiltonian is, uh, um, is a, looks like XXZ, uh, but uh, you, you don't, you don't uh, uh, the, the coefficients are a little bit different. Yeah, but, um, yeah we, uh, we just took one case that we kind of knew. Yeah, here um, I kind of 
kind of took one case that uh, kind of knew how to, like, it's very well known. It was just more to it. I agree that in some sense you could do more general things, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, but for, for uh, the things we, we did so far, we, we assumed the, this, uh, this, this problem. But yeah. So you don't have sigma 3, sigma 3? Oh, not yet. I will, for the long range, I will do, I will do it. This was just, uh, I just wanted to get s something super simple just to explain the method, so I didn't put, uh, but uh, it doesn't complicate that much more. <laughs> I could have, uh, for the long range one, I will put the, the nearest neighbor part with the sigma z, sigma z as well. So, so just repeating like what we do is basically we put this x on the transfer matrix and we apply, starts to, uh, start to compute the charges and ask them to commute. And, and for this model, what you find is that at each order, it only fixes one element. So now when we do Q2 with Q4, it again, you can solve for L6. So you can somehow put all the, this is not the most symmetric solution, but like you have, in principle, you can always solve for one element and keep all the other ones free. And, uh, and this is kind of, it kind of makes sense that you have lots of freedom because when you have the, uh, the RLL equation, you have like, uh, or in, in the Young-Baxter, there are many transformations you can make on the lax and their matrix that keep Young-Baxter um, <coughs> still satisfied. So there are like a huge equivalence class of uh, models that, uh, that uh, that you could find. So somehow I think this uh, freedom is uh, it's, it's kind of uh, encoding this information that the lax uh, uh, is not unique, like uh, in the R matrix is not unique, you can always uh, find these transformations. But the fact that, okay, so we cannot, we, so we are always ignoring these extra terms because we always check it before and we are using this, uh, this part. And this always fixes one element, so we are always solving for L6 and keeping the other five uh, elements uh, zero for this case, specific case. Uh, so, because only this contributes, it's a very easy computation. When we put on Mathematica and we solve, we manage like, it's really like in three minutes, you, saw, you find uh, this computation for 30 charges, which uh, it, this would be unthinkable if you have to start to consider all the other terms because of, because of chain rule, like uh, they, they grow very quickly. Uh, so now we have a perturbative series in, in, in U, and in principle we need to be able to sum this series back, otherwise we don't get anything from the... And this in, in principle is the hard part. For this model it's very easy, uh, it's just six vertex, so it's, uh, uh, you, you can get this very easily. Um, and, and to do that basically we put all the free ones to zero, all the free ones uh, uh, to zero, and so for this one. So, it's really not the usual six vertex that you see. It's very, it's a bit, uh, uh, you have a much more complicated element in one position than the rest is. Uh, but uh, you could bring to the traditional form by some allow transformation. So it's, uh, and then if you have uh, their matrix, you can compute the lax. Sorry, if you have the lax, you can compute their R matrix. And, uh, and it's very easy because it's a linear, RLL is linear on R, so once you have the lux, the R matrix is immediate. Um, but to, to perform that, uh, to really sum back when you have this expansion is very hard. So for all the other models except this one, we, like the, even like, well, like the, the second, like the, this more complicated six vertex for long range, we spent a week trying to sum and we didn't manage. And then we had this uh, a much simpler idea, which is like, we, we apply the method for just a few of these charges. We don't need to go to 30, just to do like a four or five. You, you know how many, and then you discover how many uh, independent ones you have. So in that case, it was just, you only had, you could solve for one in terms of the rest. But let's see, we have a more complicated one, and we have two, com two a bit complicated. Sorry, here was a star as well. Oh, I cannot touch this. Um, so we put all the freedom to zero. Um, so putting all the freedom to zero, these four become very simple, but these two are very complicated. So instead of trying to do the sum, we did something very basic, which works remarkably well, which is like, if the, all the charges need to commute, in particular, the transfer matrix needs to commute with the Hamiltonian. And since now we have like a, 
a few complicated ones, not uh, many. This immediately gives her what's the result of that sum that was very impossible to, 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 to check. So it's, uh, I don't know, we, we almost left when we, because it's something everyone knows is true, and uh, like, but just doing this uh, helps a lot. So, it, uh, yeah. Uh, and again, once we have, uh, yeah, we have our uh, L, we can put an on the so what's their matrix? Is it standard their matrix? No, yeah, so this is a very... Uh, it's, uh, by doing in, on this way, you automatically get an R matrix that of so a non-difference form. Uh, because, yeah, when you have RLL, you have... A, it doesn't need to be... So when you put here, you automatically... And then, but you can bring to the usual form by basis transformations and, uh, like, uh, allowed, transformations that are allowed by... Uh, yeah, and Baxter purposes. So, so yeah, you, you find it, you find the correct uh, something that's correct, but it's in a very unusual form. Well, it seems to me that if you start with the six vertex cell matrix, yes. whatever you do, equivalence transformation, and start to solve R R L L relation, well, it would be a great discovery if you find something new. You will not find something new. <laughs> oh, no, this was a really like a known example just to explain the, the method that we were not hoping to, to find anything uh, great. No, no, a really great discovery. So because... No, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, when you do this, if you have a Hamiltonian that's integrable, uh, the first, uh, the lowest commutation relations only give you like the first, uh, like uh, something for the L elements. But if you try to put something not integrable there, it already you fa it, it will fail because you find something that doesn't make sense for the because uh, at the lowest orders you have an uh, H there, so you can kind of uh, check that Q2 with Q3 will never be satisfied, for example, and you can find immediately that the model is not integrable. Uh, at least that uh, it's not. Uh, it will be integrable, but uh, it will not come from a regular lattice. Uh, so in principle, this could be used to classify integrable models uh, uh, at the same time as finding the lattice and the like uh, and the R. When we think about the long range ones, uh, the, um, there is one more extra ingredient we need. Uh, so let's think first in the next two nearest neighbor. And for this type of uh, object, uh, so this transfer matrix looks the same, but now this auxiliary space is doubled. So uh, we took this idea from a paper from Thomas Gomber and uh, Balash, both guy. They have a very nice paper about medium range. Uh, they called, uh, I think it's something with the cell automata in medium range uh, spin chains on the title. And they kind of developed like a, all the formalism for um, for this uh, like range three, range four, like this something that's not perturbative in principle is is exact. And they have this idea of um, increasing the auxiliary space. Uh, so here you are, you have like this uh, for the next nearest neighbor, it's like doubled, and so and you take the trace over this doubled uh, space as well. And the idea behind this is that it's like. If you have um, three spaces like A, B, like you have all these spaces, but uh, you have an operator that acts on A and one, in principle, it would be near, uh, next to nearest neighbor. But let's say you have a bigger space. Now it immediately you can uh, you can uh, you can have something that's nearest neighbor. So th th this is quite nice, and we were trying before knowing their paper, we were trying to do something similar. But we were doubling all the spaces, not only the auxiliary space, and then the calculation was huge and not uh, very efficient. And then we discovered our paper, and we, and then like you can understand that actually uh, doubling the auxiliary space is enough, because when we start with some A1, you can get A2, A3, all by normal permutation. So it, the effect is extended just automatically by the the procedure. So you don't need to double all of them. It is highly simplifies the. The, the calculation. So, and then, for example, regularity now becomes something like uh, 
if you think A as composed by two spaces, um, now like uh, uh, L of, uh, of zero uh, becomes uh, two permutations instead of one. So they check it and prove many, it's a very nice paper. And we will use this here together with this expansion to get, uh, to get the Lux and their matrix. And if you have like a range four now, Again, if you had an operator acting in A and one, it will be next to me, like a, it will be like range four operator. But if you have this big space A now, it's nearest neighbor, so you can keep kind of doing the same trick. In the dimension of this uh, space, uh, it's basically the dimension uh, of the of the physical space to the power r minus one. Uh, so you you, you kind of. Uh, you can keep going and adding more if you, if you need to do like a higher range. Could you get this by some kind of fusion from the case of a single auxiliary space? I don't know, I was thinking a little bit, but I'm, uh, I, I, I honestly didn't put... Uh, like like a, you mean like a normal fusion of our matrices and... It's for... It's less than fusion. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Take tensor products, but don't uh, use special relation between the tensor products. Yeah, for um, yeah. yeah, for example, if you if you do this, but you don't add the gen like for example, you you, you double the space, but you don't add any extra things on your Hamiltonian. What you find is like a, for the R matrix is an R matrix that. Uh, it's like a product of, uh, for XXX, for example, is a product of a four XXX uh, embedded matrix. So this big one is basically a product of four small ones, but in, with some specific embedding. So you're not uh, modifying anything in the sense when you, if you take just a normal model. Uh, I think it will become a bit clearer as I... Um, So, the method now will be to take to start with the nonsense, but including some uh, perturbative uh, uh, deformation. Uh, uh, and we will put an expansion for L now, but now you have to track of uh, G as well, so it's an expansion that will be on, uh, on G. Um, and uh, the transfer matrix now will be defined with this larger auxiliary space. And we will apply the same method as before. We will compute uh, the charges uh, and ask them to commute. And solve these equations assuming uh, uh, regularity in, uh, and asking to recover the Anzac Hamiltonian. And after applying the method for a bit, we know what which are the independent um, elements, and we do the trick of computing like uh, the matrix with the Hamiltonian to avoid to make those uh, to have to resum those series. So if we think in n equals four, for example, in S, uh, like uh, just SU two, for example. Uh, we added this, uh, uh, so with this uh, P1 tree term in the density Hamiltonian, and uh, we avoid, we try to avoid the wrapping effects for now. For uh, by, and for this you you need uh, basically to take the um, the number of sides of your chain two times the range. Uh, <laughs> but there was a paper by Tomas. Uh, where he actually, it's like really about the wrapping effect, so if you're interested on this, uh, it's a nice paper, you can uh, take a look, I can give the reference later. Uh, okay, so we tried to, so the, what we wanted to do here was to compute the locks and their matrix for, for up to range three. So, since it's range three, we need to double the oscillator space, so we have two squared. And the range is three, so to avoid wrapping effects, we are putting n equals to six. And we are solving, assuming these boundary conditions. 
And for this case, it was actually very simple. We, uh, for this range three, we not even needed the method, uh, all this expansion. You basically put a f of u in front, and you compute, uh, you compute the transfer matrix with the Hamiltonian, and directly the trick, and you get the function. So it's very simple. And then to compute the, the R matrix now, you need, uh, you need to be careful like the R matrix increases uh, in size because now you have two auxiliary spaces and each sp auxiliary space is doubled. And then you have the normal physics spa ph phys physical space. So your R matrix, it's actually 16 by 16. So you start, uh, you, you have a, um, much larger object, but it, it's really just plugging here, it's still linear, and you, you find the R matrix. And, and what happens is that, okay, now we have an R matrix, uh, and this R matrix with, uh, uh, will satisfy young Baxter up to G squared, so it's perturbative. Um, but uh, you can kind of decompose this, uh, this uh, original term, so that was, uh, that when we have the nearest neighbor was just the XXX, you can decompose this in a product of four um, R matrices. And, and this is kind of easy to check, to, to see how it happens. And then this uh, object is a new object that uh, was not known. And then we try to do the same for range four. Now we have a Hilbert, uh, like the dimension of these auxiliary spaces to, to the to three, the power three. And we need uh, eight sides on the spin chain at the minimum to get the to avoid the uh, wrapping problem problems. We still want to have SU2, so this means that the uh, the Hamiltonian, uh, this extra term, has to be of this form. Uh, and we apply the method, and we found that uh, these a's are the coefficients in front here. We applied the method, we found that these coefficients satisfy these. Uh, and if you assume that it's symmetric, the other two ones that were appearing, uh, they can be zero. And we have two deformations. But if you look very careful, this object is a range four object. Uh, so one of the deformations actually are the original Q4, the Q4 from the original one, so you are, it's nothing new. So it's actually, uh, uh, it has only one parameter, proper parameter, the deformation. And if you look it carefully, to put all the a's to zero is not a solution. This means that uh, uh, you could not have stopped it and have an, had an exact uh, integrable spin chain at range three. You need the range four term, and then you, you keep needing, uh, like uh, this basically, it shows that you need to, to add the next order. So the existence of the range three automatically forces you to have a, a range four. And then in principle, keep going. And this is nice, like it matches with the result by Tristan, my colleague, and Anna, from last year, where they, they took the um, N equals four, like the, this SU2 sector up to two loops, and they tried to study and they discovered there was chaos. If they assumed that that was all the story, they found chaos, so they found that basically the model was not integrable. Um, so um, I think it's nice. So it, it just like matches with the, the result. Uh, the explicit form of the lax is this uh, for range four. With, uh, uh, these elements. And, uh, but we still needed to to satisfy the boundary conditions. And by doing that, you f kind of fix uh, what some of the elements can be or not. And, uh, and then uh, we, uh, we found the R, just by plugging in RLL. Sorry? How many free parameters at the end lacks a parameter has? I mean... Uh... You say that some, uh, I see here a lot of, uh, on the ne next slide. Yeah, I see here like A1, A2, something that exists. No, uh, and you a say part of them are fixed. Uh, A1 and A2, are, and A2 were the only ones that were in the Hamiltonian. And uh -huh. they, 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 um, uh, uh, the free parameters from the lags are the lambdas. And, and these, uh -huh. 
uh, you need to fix some of them for the boundary conditions and then uh, and then the rest you can choose to put to zero or to keep something a bit more so how much are free at the end well, this is the question here is it more than one Yeah, there are many more. <laughs> ah, okay. So you can like many, 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 which is expected, I think, because of these transformations that you can do on Young Baxter. Many of them are probably will not be there for long range, but I expect that still some freedom would uh, okay. would be. Uh, so now it's rain. So now, if you try to rewrite in terms of what you had at the beginning, these are zero. You again. So instead of, uh, so for range four, instead of like four, x, 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 the product of four, x, x, x embedded, you have nine. And this is very easy to check, to see how you guess this just by Young Baxter. Um, I can try to draw if somebody is interested later. But the problem is that we don't know yet how to, to so we have this R2 here for range four. But we don't know how to write it in terms of the range three we, that we had in the previous order. And it would be very good to know what's really happening because then you could uh, just uh, really write um, uh, all, the, um, all the terms up to the order you, you don't know yet. And then just try to deter determine the next one. But we still don't know how to rewrite in terms of the original XXX or the... So it, it definitely, definitely you cannot... This is, it's like a new object, so we cannot write only in terms of x, 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 but I would expect that uh, you could write in, at least in terms of the range 3, R2. And we don't know how to do that yet. So this is an open question. And then at this level, this is again a new, a new object. Um, things increase quite quickly, so um, I'm not sure how, like, this was still fine to do, but I don't know. I don't know how many orders more you can go, just because of m like memory on the laptop. Because uh, so, if you see uh, the original one had uh, the range two, it was like both the locks in their matrix were four by four. The oops, but for the range three, the locks is eight by eight, but the R is already sixteen by sixteen. In the next order, the R is already sixty-four by sixty-four. So. Uh, as this increases, I think even solving a linear equation on Mathematica when the matrices are too big, Mathematica struggles sometimes, even if it, the answer is zero, sometimes it doesn't find. So, um, yeah, maybe there's a way to... Um, yeah, so it grows fast. And in this form, like in this way of doing the R matrix, the result is always of non difference form. Uh, okay, so that was for SU2. Now for the six vertex model. Now we, in comparison with the the, the, the next near uh, the nearest neighbor case, I added this uh, sigma z sigma z term. Again, we are assuming uh, all these edges don't depend on, on the spectral parameter, and that the change periodic. And we add an extra. Uh, uh, range 3 Hamiltonian. And uh, for six vertex, so we, 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 in principle we need that, uh, to, that the Hamiltonian commutes with the sigma z, uh, the total, with the total spin. And we assumed again an expansion for the lux. Uh, it has 20 non zero entries. And then we, okay, we use this expansion. We applied the method for a bit to, to find uh, like the, this commutation with the first few charges. And then we did the trick. How um, the transfer matrix is the Hamiltonian? And we found the lux. I will not show it. <laughs> it's on the appendix of the paper because it looks very ugly, the general version. Uh, and the R matrix looks uh, honestly even worse. But the. Um, the important, like one, one of the important things that we wanted to know, it, 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 that was like this, that, that deformation equation, they had uh, this um, range three deformations. And we found that there is a one to one. All the range three deformations they had for the um, Hamiltonian of the, um, of the six vertex model are generated by a lax operator. So I think this is 
in, in, in some sense, more, one more indication that the uh, deformation equation is correct. In a dream, in our opinion, something that we tried but we didn't manage to do was to apply derivatives on the lux and kind of, we, we tried to rederive the deformation equation but for, for the lux and we failed, but I think it would be very nice if we had a, something similar to the deformation equation for the lux directly because you could directly generate the lux, um, the new lux operators. So, the advantages of the method, in our opinion, is that uh, you start with a constant h, but you still can find non-difference form models. So some of them will be really non-difference form. Some of them, if you make some transformation, you'll see that actually you can rewrite in a difference form way. But you don't need to choose in advance uh, uh, if your model is uh, uh, non-difference form, uh, if you expect it to be a non-difference form or not. It's a good thing when you start with a Hamiltonian and you want to discover if it's integrable or you start with some deformation and you want to know if that is integrable. So how did you prove that some of them are of non-difference form or not gauge equivalent to non-difference form? Can you prove that? But, well, if it is related to a difference form, maybe. Yeah, working enough, usually you can, you can find out, but maybe. And I, I don't have a proof. Uh, but in principle, you can try. You can try, but I mean, to prove, no, no, I, prove me something different. I mean, you have some, <laughs> some manifold, and you have to prove that you can't parameterize it in that way. And that uh, yes, and that's quite hard. I think, in general. On Hubbard, you can, for instance, show for the Lex operator that it's living on a genus 3 curve. And this is probably a hint here. <laughs> Yeah, but the honest answer is that I don't know how to, to prove it. Um, like in the way we do this, we always find something that looks non-difference form. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the six vertex, it's quite easy to, to find the, the, the transformation. But uh, for more complicated models, I would expect it could be very hard. Mm -hmm. it not necessarily. Yes. Are there any points in your aromatics where it became like permutation operator? Yeah, it's always regular. The, the fact that mm -hmm. lux is regular, you can prove that the R is regular, just uh, as a consequence. Okay. okay. But the reliability of the transformer doesn't have a Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's yeah. just yeah. another question. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm not. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> it has, a, sorry. It has a, one thing is that when we were classifying integrable models before, we had another method, and it gener it, it had many advantages. But one disadvantage it was that instead of finding one element of each um, equivalent class, like uh, since you can do these transformations, like instead of uh, finding one, we sometimes found like. 30 models that could all be related by by gauge transformations or base transformations. So it was uh, twists and all that. So it was really the hardest part of the method was distinguish which mo models were independent and which were not. Which is related to your question also. Like uh, it's not necessarily non-difference form, but uh, uh, like to map two models. And this one you find one element of each. Maybe it's in a very funny form, it's not the form, uh, this standard form you would expect, but you found only one. So for us this is an advantage because you can always start to apply transformations and try to find something that's interesting for what you're doing or not, but when you have many, it's a harder problem to... So for us it was a positive point. And then, yeah, you can use it to find uh, the lux in their matrix um, if, if they are regular. Maybe this Hamilton, if you try a Hamiltonian and you discover you may think it's not integrable, it could come from a non-regular object. This we cannot say anything about, but if it's regular, we believe you are, and it has a, that type of answer, so we, we believe you are finding all. So these are my wishes for the future. Some things I really would like, to, like and also like with the group, like we'd like to, to address them. And the first is that I said that one of the advantages of having an R matrix and a lux is that you can perform the algebraic batanzas. The disadvantage is that uh, nobody knows how to do the algebraic batanzas for long range. Uh, so this is our priority now. We are, with Marius, we are trying to, 
understand how to do for a perturbative uh, uh, near next to nearest neighbor first. So this is a nice case because it has only p13 extra, so it's not uh, it's not that much more complicated. But we think we could uh, learn some if we could solve the simple the simple case. Maybe we can learn some things that could help to do something uh, bigger later. Um, another thing that I particularly would like to do is like um, in the same way that there are all these nice classifications by Jimbo. Uh, Kuniba and uh, Bajanov on, uh, on for affine algebras, for example, that you have all their matrices written in terms of unit uh, uh, matrix like uh, EIJ. Uh, I, I, I don't know, for me it like, would be very interesting to know, like, uh, even perturbatively, what are the general forms for, like, uh, for if you look at the algebras, uh, but not even affine, just uh, like uh, uh, simple algebras. How you uh, if if you, you could classify all the like uh, first uh, like the first uh, like the nearest neighbor deformations and you could write like some uh, but this I'm not even started so that's something I, I find interesting and I think it would be nice. Um, another thing is that uh, that method I mentioned that we were doing before had some advantages in comparison with uh, for nearest neighbor, so I would like to try to find a hybrid between them like this and that one. Because I think it would be, just to be more efficient and when put on Mathematica, you could do things a bit faster. Um, in terms of um, N equals 4, for example, to apply to other sectors, like uh, try to understand uh, SU1 slash 1, or for the uh, something non-compact, but non-compact is very hard in the moment in the way we are doing, because we are kind of expanding, you need to, I think you need to rethink a lot of things if you want to do that. And I'm working with Chiara in trying to generalize for open chains. So that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. We have time for questions. And your perturbative R matrices, do they satisfy the Ann Bexley equation? Yes. That was the first thing we checked uh, as soon as we find them. <laughs> yes. It's not clear from the construction. No, no, I agree. But uh, so that part uh, we do as a check. Okay. Uh, so for each case, we check it. And they so I'm really impressed. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> when I saw the zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, their matrices are very well classified solutions of the by some class related to quantum groups. We understand how. Yes. They're related to the presentation theory of quantum groups. Yes. And so, but there are a few exceptions. For example, Martin's solution and the uh, Hubbard model doesn't fit nicely. But the rest is within the quantum group. So if you get something outside, it's very interesting. So do you always get something which is, has been known? I'm not sure if I understood the, the end of the question, so... So the R matrix you, uh, you get, if it is a product of six vertex R matrices, well, that's trivial, that's called multiplication. Yeah, but, 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 but if it is something which is, doesn't belong to the theory of quantum group, do, do you get such R matrices, something completely new? Um, from, from this, not, not so far, but we didn't try many things yet, we just... Uh, so you didn't get newer matrices. What about your perturbative, say, uh, inside our matrix? You say it's new. Oh, uh, I, I mean that... I mean, the question of uh, yeah. Nadimir is if it's uh, if by some transformation can be identified as something known. Uh, but you could use, actually, this boost automorphism method. It's not related to this talk, but that produces new R matrices, no? Oh, no, no, with that, yes, I just meant we did, like, we found many... Maybe it's an answer. For, 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 the question, in, like, in general, this other method that I just mentioned very quickly that we found, we found many, many cases that don't have, we, know, not, we have no idea what's the symmetry, uh, just by, by applying the method, because, uh, uh, because we can start with uh, some very, like non-standard ansets as well, like, doesn't, like we, we, we didn't manage to, 
to relate um, most of the new models <coughs> with um, with um, with common groups and. That's and interesting. Know, like, uh, if you get something, can you think of some check if I give you an arm matrix to show that it's not related to a common group? Yes, yes, yes. If, if you are all common, yes? isn't? If you are all common, no. at least for that method. Uh, I, okay, again, I cannot talk about this uh, talk, but I can uh, tell you what Tamash and Gongo and Balash Kozhai produce. It. They produce it really a lot of matrices. Uh, some of them were well known before, but we don't. Uh, but even uh, you say everything uh, except Hubbard uh, fall into this quantum group. For example, Barrier model was derived by Balash. Who knows Barrier, what is Barrier group? Uh, what is Barrier matrix, for example? There were some more matrices that were not known before definitely, at least we didn't find in literature. And there was a try to, to exp uh, make a so-called house expansion, expansion in Gauss coordinate. Because it's always produced you understand what is quantum algebra. And it was discovered that, well, it's not ABCD series, maybe the expansion algebras. At least. So, something new there. Okay, I have to have a look. Yeah, for example, like with the other method, we also found like we 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 try to classify some models that had like identity permutation and k, but uh, but that you will not sum up to 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 the rank of uh, of your algebra. You would stop before, and we we did like some linear the most linear combination of these models, and we found, for example, something that uh, it has. Um, like the simplest of the model we found, it has like symmetry that is like this GL, uh, like some GL uh, I, uh, GL J, like it's some kind of graded model, but it doesn't fit on the normal graded uh, ones. We have like many, it's not only like like a GL M slash uh, N, it's like, um, it's much more like we have many, many, and when you start to study the properties, for example, some parts have um, so, like, some 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 of the generators behave as like um, as uh, bosonic at some point and fermionic. So, and then in, in the other models they don't fit in any symmetry we understand so far. So so you can find uh, many things that are out of this quantum group uh, story with these uh, methods. And uh, because I think most of the these classifications before they were actually based on on the on the algebras in a very nice way. So you could you could really write all these classifications in a nice way. But in the way we are doing, we are completely not assuming anything about symmetry. So, so yeah, we have something up here, like some, but at this ex specific method, with this specific method, there is nothing we really specifically. Yeah. For the when you do the the formation of the isotropic uh, model, AC2 symmetry. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, how uh, to, to which uh, range uh, did you did you go four sides or? No, we, oh, we we did that to range four. Uh, okay. So uh, how many solutions, different solutions you get for this uh, independent uh, for, for 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 the term uh, with four spins? Uh, uh, do you have uh, a lot of freedom? <coughs> yeah, yeah. This is what what he was uh, for the lux, yes. Uh, no, uh, but oh, uh, no, no, for the oh, for no, the. No, 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 there's only one. There's only one equation. Uh, okay. Um, that is independent. Like that, you you find Q four as well. You find some things that you actually can map to uh, to. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, because you you could also add the the fourth the fourth charge of uh, of x x x and then uh, this is not really. Yeah, and we assume parity. Um, yes. In Paris, if you relax that, you have to Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so then that's consistent with what we know from. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Anna again. Okay.